I need to, uh, I should have done this before. You should be good, Brandon. We should be on. Well, yeah. everybody let us know if I'm live. Um, if I am, then uh, welcome to the stream. It has uh, been a weird couple of weeks, I assume for many of you, as it is for me. Uh, we are now signing Mistborn Leatherbound pages, because uh, these are due yesterday, I believe. Um, Kara wants these, so we're going to be doing our normal thing, which is you're going to be firing questions at us, and Adam is going to be asking them to me, and I'm going to answer them on the, the stream. I hope you guys are all sa staying safe. We're good? Yep. yep. We, we should be good. Oh, um, yeah. Maybe a hygiene thing? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, um, we are practicing social distancing here today, which means you're not going to see my wonderful assistants coming and picking up the pages of paper anymore, because we're trying to stay six feet away from each other, which is what has been recommended by the CDC, and we are doing a lot of hand washing. So we'll just uh, throw a little shout out to you there. Um, Wash your hands for 20 seconds. That sounds like an eternity when you're doing it, uh, but that is the recommendation. And so we have been doing that at home. I'm gonna try very hard not to get this disease until July, if at all, after I've turned in Stormlight 4. Because taking several weeks uh, for flu-like symptoms right now uh, would be not good timing for getting the book in on time. So. We're doing everything we can here, uh, but we're also going to stream to hopefully keep some of you entertained if you are going stir crazy and locked in your houses. Uh, maybe we will do this a couple more times, maybe not. Adam is going to be taking some paternity leave here pretty soon. Tomorrow's so, the day. Tomorrow, so if we do it, we may have to have a different person in Adam's spot as he is being a dad. It uh, might be nice to get a break though. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a um, good excuse. The other thing that we want to start doing here, we do this with some measure of, uh, of timidness, perhaps. Uh, we want to maybe start uh, opening fan mail on these live streams to break things up. So um, Adam, a little bit later, is going to pop up our P.O. box, um, and I'll draw attention to it when he does. But if you've had something you want to send me that you think would be interesting to be uh, shown on screen um, during streams, go ahead and send them. I will warn you, Adam is going to screen these, which means, yeah. Oh, and I will say that I'll also add this to the description. So yeah. those who are not watching this live don't yeah. need to find it at the end. Yes, we will add it to the description at the end so you can come back to this. But yes, Adam will be screening these. And so, um, you know, don't send anything that uh, you think is going to make me very embarrassed unless it's actually funny and uh, it is appropriate for the stream. Feel free to send funny things you think would embarrass me that are appropriate to the stream. Adam will be the ultimate judge of that. Um, if you want to send regular fan mail letters, you can send those too. Um, I do try to read those. These days we've had to move to mostly form responses on both fan mail pers in person and fan mail um, on, uh, in person, in physical fan mail and um, email. I used to be able to answer these. Those years are past. Uh, I do generally read all of them. Even all of those who were asking me for something time sensitive, which I normally can't even get back to. But regardless, um, if you want to send us fan mail, Adam will post the... Uh, the, the address, uh, just make sure it's Attention Adam, uh, who is going to, like I said, look through them all. And he I am not going to see them ahead of time, so you'll get to see my genuine reaction to them. The other thing I'll say is we're probably not going to um, be wanting to uh, shill products. I know a lot of you might want to send something in and have us mention your Tumblr or something. We're unlikely to do that. Um, just for various reasons. We can't completely vet things. Uh, we don't want to recommend them if we do. So um, this is not a time, for instance, to send me um, manuscripts you want me to read, unfortunately, um, or uh, things like that. But do feel free to send us fan art. We will happily show that off. Um, feel free to send all those wacky things that you guys uh, like to give me in person when I do signings, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, we'll see if we have to call um, a halt to it uh, if it gets a little too crazy, but a little crazy is good. 
Uh, let's go ahead and start into some questions. Cool. Um, the first one says, hi, Brandon. Hello. Uh, I have a question for when you start. It says, as an aspiring author, I'm curious which you would submit to first, publisher and how many did you send out when you were breaking in? This is an excellent question. So uh, one thing to keep in mind on anything relating to publishing, um, I broke in now um, 15 years ago. This means that while I do my best to keep up to date, on all of this stuff. I am not gonna be as good a resource to you as editors and agents who are right now acquiring or other authors who have recently broke in. They will be your best resource. Like I said, I do try to keep up to date, but all the, you know, the, the time where I had to really pay attention to it was 15 years ago and industries changed. So this is a place where I may not seem to be, I may not be as, an, as much an expert as I seem to be. Um, so, I was told submit to agents first. Um, this is the standard method of operation. Um, about 20 years ago, so right before I broke in, agents started to become the de facto slush pile for a lot of the big publishers. Um, this coincided with agents actually increasing their rates. They used to take 10%. Um, of what uh, an author earned, and they moved it up to 15%. Uh, and the general explanation was this, was that were, is that they were hiring more people to do the slush pile. Um, and as far as I know, that is still the standard, 15%, um, and agents have the slush piles. That said, um, I took, listened to that advice, and I very calculatedly ignored it meaning I hunted agents and editors at the same time. Um, I figured that the more places I was submitting, the better. This was also something I could do with my eyes open because I was a fast writer even then. When I was trying to break in, I had a dozen novels that I had already written. And if um, the big danger of submitting to editors directly that agents will say why they don't want you to do it is if you submit it all around town to all the editors and then an agent picks it up they're going to be frustrated that the book has already been submitted to all of these editors um, as they think that the book has already been rejected um, my opinion on this which again is goes against the conventional wisdom so get multiple pieces of advice on this my instincts were that I was mostly getting form rejections anyway and if editors who had given me form rejections like got the book again later on, I didn't think it would be that big a deal. And plus I had so many books that I was submitting that if an agent picked me up, an agent is generally trying to pick up an author, not a book. And that if they found out one of my books was, had been submitted all around town, well, then I would have another book for them. Um, agents again, generally recommend against this. Um, but it worked out for me because the first person who bought one of my books, the first real um, acceptance I got was from an editor and not from an agent. Um, and it was uh, to Tor Books where I submitted Elantris to Moshe Fader. Uh, Tor generally has pretty liberal submission guides to um, guidelines for authors allowing unagent submissions that might have changed in the last uh, years. I don't know for sure. Uh, but I had met Moshe at a convention in Montreal. Uh, he seemed like he was a really great guy. He liked the same sort of stuff I did. So I sent him a book. When he called offering to buy it, I had also been submitting to agents and had gotten numerous bits of feedback from various different agents, which kind of let me um, audition agents because I was seeing what kind of feedback they were giving. And so I called Joshua Bilmes, who is still my agent, and said, I have an offer on a book that I didn't send to you. Uh, would you be willing to represent it? Because he had given me the best feedback of any of the agents I'd gotten. They had all rejected me, Joshua included, but he had rejected me with a please send me your next thing, which I had, which he had rejected me with a much better editorial letter uh, with a lot of things. Later on, he told me, uh, Brandon, I don't usually send an editorial letter that in depth unless I'm asking the author to rewrite, but I generally don't want to ask them explicitly to rewrite because that feels like it makes too much of a promise to them. So partially I was waiting to see if you, would re if you could revise and send back a revised manuscript, which I had not known. But either way, uh, Joshua had not seen this book and he was more than eager to pick me up having had me do half of the work already. In fact, he, um, he offered 
um, after he read the book and liked it to take only a 10% commission on that contract because he said, you already did part of my job. I feel like it would be unfair of me to charge you a full commission on this, which I've always remembered. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, this might be a do as I say, not as I do, but I'm not sure. You're going to have to ask around, ask other people um, and find out what works for you. This next question, I'm hoping that you're okay answering, okay. says, mm -hmm. so far the Stormlight Archives book titles have the abbreviations W-O-K, W-O-R-O, and R-O-W. Will book five's abbreviation be K-O-W, making the complete Kedic? Right. Um, so, great question. Uh, so, way back when I started working on the Stormlight Archive, I wanted to do this. And then I just didn't think it would work out for various reasons. Um, and I backed away from it, coming up with my kind of working titles that were not a Kitek. Uh, after I did changed um, book two to Words of Radiance, I realized I might have a chance to do this. And it started to kind of get in my head that maybe I'd do it, maybe I wouldn't. I waited to see if uh, book three would work as a single word title, which it did. Um, and so... I am intending to do this. The, the question we have internally and that you guys may want to ruminate on is where we put the T because Way of Kings actually has a the in it where Words of Radiance and Oathbringer do not and neither does Rhythm of War. So um, is it going to be, is it going to have a T at the end or not? Uh, that is a subject to debate even internally right now. Uh, and James M says, Brandon, who's your favorite commander in EDH? Oh boy. Um, I generally play EDH, um, drafting, uh, with my, my commander cube. And in that case, uh, my favorite commander is, um, uh, Urza Academy Headmaster, uh, because of the sheer goofiness factor. Um, but if I am not doing, um, a draft, uh, I will probably take one of the various, um, blue black ones. Like I really like Lazov. Um, I really like the whole I clone your stuff um, EDH deck. Um, I clone and steal your stuff uh, dot deck. So um, you can see I'm wearing my, my, my blue shirt here, um, which has my Esper colors somewhat uh, represented. And so it'll be some variety of Esper. My very first uh, EDH deck was uh, Chromium uh, back in the day. Uh, which is the Esper Elder Dragon. So there you go. Zachary Fisher asks in, uh, for anything you can tell them about your visit to the Wheel of Time set. Uh, boy, what can I tell you about my visit to the Wheel of Time set? I got to meet all of the actors, uh, which was awesome. And they were really cool. Like Matt talked my ear off um, in a good way. Like he was asking my impressions of the character. He was asking, I mentioned to him that his character was the hardest to write for me. Um, and so we had a big conversation about why I thought that was and, uh, and things like that. And I pointed him at some fan resources who talk about um, how Robert Jordan wrote uh, Matt uh, different from how I wrote Matt, which I thought would be very useful to him. Um, and... Uh, but I chatted with all of them. Uh, it was it was really fun. Um, I got to see Bella. I tried to get a picture with Bella, but uh, they were moving the horses away, and I didn't end up getting the picture with Bella. So I'm sorry about that. I, I wanted to do the cast reveal, um, uh, where I'm like, it's time for I've got casting news, and then it's me with a pic uh, picture with uh, with the horse playing Bella. Um, it was great. Um, I mean, I don't know what else I can say other than they treated me really well. Um, the actors were all great. Um, the scenes that I saw, I was very impressed by just the acting quality um, of them. And um, uh, Moiraine is just spot on. I was so impressed with her, the way she was acting. And man, she is, uh, she is great. Uh, she was doing the thing where like a character commands, the, or an actor commands attention in the scene without saying so in this way that just, I can't even, she had presence uh, in just the perfect Moraine sort of way. So there's a few things for you. Um, so I'm very excited for the series. David Gelber says, is there any story which you would want to reimagine if you had the time to write it? 
A story I would want to reimagine of mine or someone else's. They did not specify. Um, so the one I am most likely to want to reimagine is Mistborn because I am doing the screenplay. As you can see, we now have the progress bar up on that. Um, and it's been very fun to reimagine it, uh, kind of doing some of the things that over the years I wished I'd done. Like, uh, no spoilers, but the ending of, of Mistborn has a bit of a deus ex machina to it that I would rather find a way to not have happen. Um, I'd like a little bit of the pacing and plotting to be more elegant. Um, uh, a bunch of stuff with the the um, the Ska Rebellion and things just never quite come together came together in the book the way I wanted it to. Um, and so that's the one of mine I'm most likely to actually reimagine. Um, there's a decent chance if I decide to adapt Emperor's Soul to the screen that I would have to do a reimagining of that as well to make it work as a film rather than happening in one room. Um, of someone else's, uh, this is going to come as very little surprise to you, but basically like every other author of my generation, there's been a wish in the back of my head that I could somehow fix episode one, right? That I could write an episode one that works and uh, fulfills some of the things that I wish it had done, you know? And uh, Star Wars, if you are confused, which I'm sure no one is. Uh, an episode one that focuses on Obi-Wan as it probably should have, in my opinion. Well, should have is a strong term. Lucas made the film he wants to, and there's no should have when someone makes their piece of art the way they want to make it. And he is totally legitimately... Uh, you know, there's like nothing, I can't say he should have done this or should have done that, in other words. But if I'd had the chance, if uh, in some weird alternate dimension, George Lucas calls me and says, Brandon, what would you do for episode one? Um, so it's never going to happen. I am not going to take eight months of my life and write an episode one fanfic. Um, but uh, that would be the thing that, you know, it's... It's, it's in some ways, my, my generation's white whale in some ways. Like, I was there on opening night the first day, and, um, and it just didn't quite go the way that I had always imagined it, which is okay, again, but it also contradicted a bunch of stuff that the movies had said. And anyway, uh, I'll leave it there. Um, I would love to have, in an alternate dimension, had a chance at that. Um, Garrett Whiffen says, uh, how, or asks, how do you develop your fantasy languages? So fantasy languages are one of these things you can pour a lot of time into. Um, uh, I took three or four linguistics classes in college, uh, enough to be dangerous, but not enough to really know what I'm doing. And, um, I have found that Developing fantasy languages for me centers around picking morphemes um, and and sounds in such a way that I can construct a language that feels like it's completely built. But I have not done the work that Tolkien has done for most of his or for his language on most of mine. Uh, a couple of them are closer than others, um, but I'm not making true conlangs in most cases. Uh, what I generally do is I say, all right, what are what are I'm gonna buy? By the way, I'm gonna talk, but I'm gonna scoot across and move these things. Oh. So. Um, so, we need to scoot this over. You don't have to move that, Adam. Um, They're just very location sensitive. Location sensitive. Okay, I'll talk after this. Okay. Well, then I'm going to do a quick switch. People are going to see a fade to blue real quick, and then I'll bring it back. Oh, it's a quick switch. Um, I have a plug in the wrong place. Oh, a plug's in the wrong place. All right. Okay, and you should be you should be back. Sorry about the guys. This is just us trying to be responsible um, and not get each other sick. And just in case, uh, so uh, remind me of the question, Adam. Um, languages. Languages. So um, if if you want to dig in deep, you totally can. Um, I have an advantage that Peter, my editorial director, is a linguist. Um, that is what he studied in college, so I can always ask him for help. I'm looking for sounds. I'm looking for, you know, basic things. Like, you do a little bit of research, you'll discover that some languages use fewer sounds than others, and that's why a lot of the words get longer, because they have to repeat sounds more often to make distinctive words, right? Um, you find different sort of 
sounds tend to go with each other in different languages and you find different styles of sounds that are used uh, in English that aren't used in other languages and vice versa. And it gets very fun to go there, but you can, in creating multiple languages lies years and years of work that I think you could totally do if you wanted to, but um, I use most of my world building time on other things. Adam B. says, how do you decide which stories need to be told when as you work your way through the Cosmere? Um, uh, mostly which stories need to tell when in the Cosmere is affected by what I'm most excited to write right now. Um, the Cosmere so far has been separated enough that I can look at what I'm really passionate about and write it, and there's been no reason so far to put those very out of order chronologically. Um, the further we go, the more that'll have to be, um, right? Like the Wax and Wayne books t happen chronologically after Stormlight uh, 1 through 5, and so it's already begun a little bit, but for the most part, it was what am I passionate about writing? What do I feel like n is the best book for me to write? And then I make sure it fits into the chronology rather than, um, than otherwise. Again, the further we go, the more these things lock into place. Um, like White Sand is jumping backward in time. Um, and when I do Dragon Steel, it's gonna jump even further. Uh, so this will happen more and more as we go. But right now, just, I write what I'm passionate about. Uh, Paralicular um, says, how do you, how, and I'm guessing this is a writing question. Mm -hmm. um, they're wanting to know how you can control the ramping of, a, of power levels from human to godlike. Yeah, so controlling power levels. Now, knowing how long your series is going to be, or at least how long you would in, you would like it to be at the start, is definitely going to be a help here. Um, also, understanding how to make character conflicts that both fall into the character's uh, skill wheelhouse um, and those that don't. Meaning, uh, finding a challenge for a character, you don't want... So, I often talk in my class about the idea that stories happen around the things that the character of the magic can't do, generally. This is just kind of storytelling um, basics. If you've got a character that is, um, that is an excellent, excellent boxer, then you tell a story about either someone who is a stronger boxer than them that they have to face, or you tell a story about boxing being a side story to the character's rest of the character's story. Um, and this is just so that there is tension and conflict. And getting good at balancing those, right, is going to be very helpful for you. Because you don't want to just have things happen that, um, that the character's skill mean nothing to, right? If your character is a boxer, you need boxing matches to be happening in your story in almost all varieties of stories you're going to be writing. Um, and if your boxer is the best boxer in the world, you still are going to be expected to have boxing matches. You're going to have to find a way to make it still tense. Uh, but you can do this in a lot of different ways, right? Uh, it can be someone is better than them. It can be that they get injured. It can be they get older and their skill isn't um, as, as what it once was. Or they can be at the height of their skill, but there's some sort of marathon they have to go through where they're going to have to defeat a bunch of opponents um, in a row. Just coming up, understanding how you can ramp up those kinds of conflicts and then how you can balance them with character conflicts, and external, internal conflicts, and conflicts about what the character cannot do. Um, and you will find that it works. Uh, Superman still works as a character. I know that uh, there are a lot of stories that don't work with him, but there are a lot of stories that still do, and he's near deific in power. Uh, Rand Althor in The Wheel of Time is basically a demigod by the time I took over the books, and um, he was a blast to write. Um, I never felt worried about power level concerns in the three books I was writing because um, I was able to balance these sorts of things because Robert Jordan had left me the seeds or the, the half-done story threads to be able to do this. So uh, practice those things. Tanner Boyce uh, was hoping that you talk a bit about the book you wanted to write about people getting magic powers from when they're sick. Yeah, the book I want to write, uh, Silence Divine, about... It would be a really great time to write this right now. In fact, someone wrote <laughs> to me on Reddit. It's like, hey, you going to write this now? Uh, problem is, it is not a good time to write this because Stormlight 4 is due July 1st. And I am needing to finish the third draft um, this week and then launch into the fourth of five drafts. Um, 
This story, um, I always get a ton of offers from people to help me out with it, which I, I really do appreciate you guys doing that because my, um, my immunology experience is kind of low, which is why I didn't actually write the story when I wanted to. For those who don't know, the idea is that uh, you get a disease and the microorganisms do the disease. Maybe we're live. Maybe we're not. Schrodinger's stream. It, indeed it is. It looks like we should be good. Mm. I'm going to have to buy you a new computer, huh? This is... This is the new computer? Good, well, this is... I wanted <laughs> to get the cheapest one I could because oh. you got me the good editing one upstairs. Upstairs. So you bought a cheap laptop, but we yes. may not have... May, well, maybe you need to give the cheap laptop to Emily and buy a nice laptop okay. if, this, well, if this keeps we, going. We can discuss that. We can discuss that. Okay. Uh, you guys are really expensive. I, I hope yes, you all know I, that. Yes, I do apologize. <laughs> not you expensive. I'm oh, talking them? to them. Okay. Yes. No, you then just they should apologize for sure. <laughs> uh, well, they also pay all of our salaries yes, and thank offer you. all of us to live. So they might be expensive, but they uh, <laughs> we, we come out in the black in this relationship. So, um, Adam, do we have these monetized yet? Are we're we gonna, still we, figuring, we're still that, figuring out. that out. They haven't emailed yeah. me back about my last thing. We so. probably are going to eventually. Like, I was uncertain if we were going to monetize, but a lot of people in the YouTube ecosystem say you should monetize because um, YouTube recommends your videos more. Perhaps we're makes not you sure more visible. How the heck yeah. Algorithm works yeah. if you monetize. Um, and plus, Adam has spends a lot of time doing this, and so we may apply that money to his salary. Um, but regardless, uh, so this this. Cool story about people who get a disease, get super, uh, magical talents while they have the disease, and then whatnot. I will write this someday. This takes place on Ashen, which is in the Rosharan system. Um, and there is kind of deep lore stuff about the history of Roshar that, is, that Ashen is related to, and I want to do that. And there's some, some fun interconnectivity to the magics. I just haven't had the time yet. Um, there are those who are watching who are very into uh, immunology. I do have people offering to help me out. Um, I certainly wouldn't say no to more offers of help uh, since I, some of you may have already written to me and said, I'll help out. And then that was like on Reddit, which has a terrible uh, message management system. And so I'm usually good at copying and pasting usernames and or emails of people into a file, but not always. Um, someday I'll write this story. Um, the big trick is I'm gonna have to, I mean, viruses and bacteria are so different um, I have to like commit to one or the other, or I can do both, but then I'm going to have to deal with that. And then there's the, the whole, uh, part of it, me wanting certain, um, certain chronic diseases to have longer lasting abilities. And I'm not sure if that will work. There's just all sorts of questions that I just need to sit down with a panel of experts and ask them my stupid questions and have them tell me what I'm what I'm doing wrong so we can actually make this work. Yeah, it would be an amazing story. So yeah, I, I like think it'll, it'll be great when I write it someday. The thing is I have to finish this Stormlight and then I really do want to have a novella uh, in the Stormlight universe. Probably not this one, um, something actually on Roshar um, um, to do with the Kickstarter, right? Because a lot of people want, are, are fans and want to read new stuff, but do not have the means or the inclination to spend $200 on a leather-bound copy of The Way of Kings. Um, and we would like to have something on there that people who want to spend less money can uh, get all the swag um, and instead of uh, buying this very beautiful but very expensive book. They could also just buy the uh, the novella. So I want to do something like Edge Dancer um, that will take place between books uh, three and four. Uh, Ray Game is curious about your editing process, specifically wondering if you edit. Uh, on a PC, you can sometimes give something more memory uh, or whatnot. But... Well, this should have plenty of memory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, no, the program. They can, oh. they can assign on a PC a program more memory, but sometimes yeah, I should look at I should look are into that. locked in the amount of memory they can take. I am not a computer yeah. person, so I can't tell you. Yeah, I think I, we're I think we're back. Um, I, I do know that to make my kids Minecraft work at one point, I had to actually go in and assign it more memory okay. than it was uh, than it was having. So. Well, knowing Mac, that won't be possible. <laughs> yes, knowing Mac, that won't be as possible. Uh, sorry, guys, uh, we may have to buy a better computer. Every time we have, we fix the problems we had before, but then we have new ones. Always new ones. Uh, always new ones. 
That poor computer, I can hear it from over here. Yeah. Uh, it is a brand new Mac, but it's the cheap one. Yes. It's cheap for a Mac. Yeah. yeah. What the, was che the, question? the second cheapest one I could get. <laughs> what um, was the question? I was, uh, it was about editing. Editing. Oh, yeah. Good question. So um, I prefer to go straight through. I find that if I go back and start fixing things, a decent percentage of the time, I find that it doesn't work. Or that I get it all fixed, and then I go forward, and I realize, oh, I made the wrong uh, fix. I need a different fix for this to actually work. And so I found that what works best for me is to, if I think I'm going to make a change, I start writing the next chapter as if that change had already been made. And then I um, continue forward if I like it. And I just keep going. And if I don't like it, I don't go back and fix that generally. I just change and keep going the way I had been going. And so a first draft of a book of mine can get really strange uh, along these lines. Um, I know different people love to revise as they go, so this is definitely not um, something that is universal. But for me, I, I feel like the momentum of finishing a book is just so important. Stopping part of the way through a book always has a detrimental effect. Um, on the rest of the book is what I found. Um, I can fix those detrimental effects, don't get me wrong, but um, it causes a lot more work. So I'm now going to end because now it's not picking up the audio. It's only using my computer audio. Oh. So I'm going to restart it We're real quick. Restart the stream. Okay. All righty. We'll be uh, back yeah. shortly. And we should be live now. Um, if it's really bad on Facebook, do you want me to kill Facebook? Yeah, if it's really bad on Facebook, guys, we'll make you move over. So go ahead and give us some more uh, some more feedback there, um, or we'll yeah we'll we'll see we'll see what we're doing. If this keeps cutting out, it might be better just to make everyone go to one platform and uh, and do yeah. that again until we can try with a better computer. Oh, okay, always something. Man, Adam puts a lot of work into making these things work. Uh, too much. And then, and then it does this to him every yeah, time. Yeah, little hiccups. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that would probably make it easier is if we had an Ethernet cable, but Mac got rid of Ethernet cables on their laptops. So oh, no Ethernet All Wi-Fi. I know Daniel Green just told me that I always use Ethernet, but I can't, Daniel, so leave me alone. <laughs> Yeah, we could like well, get some sort of adapter. Out. Maybe I might be able to get one of these that does. But. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, James M. says, wants to know who your favorite commander in Magic is. Do you have an, and wants to know if you have an online list uh, for your commander cube. Uh, we do have an online list for the commander cube. Adam will post that in the description afterward. Um, I posted it a while ago. I'm not sure exactly where you find it. Um, I do think it's linked on the commander cube. Um, I think it's there on the game nights episode maybe it should be. um it should be but we'll we'll try to link that here as well um i talked about my favorite commanders earlier in the uh in the stream i like five color commanders i like any goofy five color commander i can make work particularly in my draft um if it's not five color then any any sort of uh of weird steal your dude or clone your dude like i made i can't say her name like marik i made a marik deck she's like she's got like the, one of the original legends uh she was fun uh, but Esper, steal your stuff. Um, that's my that's my thing. Um, and Brandon Schumann wants to know why you're making three stacks. Uh, so three stacks are because these pens, which I love, we spent a lot of time figuring out the best pen. Uh, you'll notice that my signature is very, uh, very loose, very fast. Um, and uh, a lot of pens will skip when I do that, so we need to find ones that flow really fast. But that also means when I first put the pen down and when I uh, pick it up at the end, it leaves a little dot, which if I put them all on top of each other, will leave a little, couple little dots on whichever page um, this is uh, in the book. And so instead of doing that, I just put them in three separate stacks just to give the ink a little more time to dry. Uh, Dylan Huras, or Daniel Huras wants to know who your hardest character to write is, or has been. Hardest character by far was Matt Coffin of The Wheel of Time. Um, not Cat Swain? Not Cat Swain. Cat Swain was not actually that hard to write. I just, you just did not like him. I don't like Cat Swain, or at least I didn't when I was a fan of the series. I came to have a grudging respect for Cat Swain as I wrote her in the series. Um, but Cat Swain was always the, you're not my real mom, 
uh, sort of uh, sort of Rand um, Moirin uh, stand-in for parts of the books. And so, you know, I was always uh, rebellious toward Cad Swain. Uh, Matt was really hard. Uh, Matt is really hard for a couple of reasons. Um, Matt is one of these interesting characters who's, um, who what he says, what he does, and what he thinks are often three different things. Uh, he's an unreliable narrator in a very fascinating and interesting way. Uh, I feel like he was um, Robert Jordan's strongest written character just by pure use of prose. Um, and he was also very intimate and personal to Robert Jordan as a character. And getting that right was really hard. Um, uh, my, my Matt and Gathering Storm, um, I think, is noticeably different. And it wasn't that I, like, I got better at it, but it took me a while to figure out how to do Matt. Um, I still don't think at the end I was 100% there. But by the, by the, in the first book, people can have come and said, I think you wrote this part, I think Robert Jordan wrote this part, and they, they're right. By the last book, when it comes to Matt, they're wrong a lot of the time. Um, so that tells me that some, I, I've started doing, I started doing some things right about Matt. Um, it also got easier in those later books because uh, I had more of Robert Jordan's Matt to work with in the, particularly in the second book. Um, and so uh, that's, that just helped a ton. Um, but regardless, Matt was the hardest. Um, characters in my own books that are the hardest to write, uh, I don't really even approach that way. It's hard for me to answer because um, <sighs> characters are not on a difficulty level for me as, as characters. Uh, some sequences with given characters are difficult to write. Uh, Seizet in book three of Mistborn is a great example because what Seizet is going through is a difficult thing to make interesting on the page, and that was a big challenge. Uh, Dalinar in Way of Kings was difficult to write for the same reasons, right? Um, what he's going through was a tough sort of uh, thing to convey in a way that is engaging um, for readers. And so it's... Some things can have a challenge. Uh, lately, Shalon tends to be the toughest. Uh, just balancing um, all of her different altars um, and things like that is just, it's a, it is a challenge. Uh, Zen the Poet wants to know if COVID-9 COVID or whatever yes. um, could prevent Rhythm of War from being released as scheduled. Uh, would the uh, virus prevent Rhythm of War from being released as scheduled? Um, Let's certainly hope that by November nothing is happening that is, uh, that is too problematic. But the fact that um, so much of our sales are digital, um, I think would probably make it fine. Uh, a Stormlight book is, is these days a, um, is over 80% digital. Um, and because of that, uh, I don't think we would have the problem that uh, movies have. In fact, maybe we would sell even better because people would be confined to their houses and things like that. Uh, so, no, I don't think it would, uh, it would ever uh, impact it. Even if it were releasing next month or this month, I think we would probably still be on schedule. Just an advantage we have over the cinema people um, in that most of the time you're going to be reading the book by yourself and uh, you can, you know, the mail is still going and so you could get it off of uh, an online retailer even if you wanted a, f a physical edition. Uh, Dylan Reed says, Hi, Brando. Hey, how would you approach writing a series of novels versus writing a standalone? What are the key things one should consider when planning for one or the other? Great. Um, so, um, I'm glad you're asking this question. This is, comes down to personal philosophy. So, again, this is another question to ask a couple of writers uh, so you can get a wide variety of uh, viewpoints on it. I feel that the best thing you can do for a series is to make the first book stand very strongly on its own. Um, I love it personally when I read a book series that the first book feels like a complete novel. And I give uh, second books the opportunity to sometimes not feel as necessarily complete. Uh, this is, you know, exemplified in this uh, original Star Wars trilogy, right? Uh, New Hope stands very well on its own. Empire Strikes Back is still a standalone adventure. But that story is not done until you have Return of the Jedi. And so it's really like you've got one story and then another story in two parts. Um, and that works really well for trilogies, I've found. Um, 
I this is I think particularly important as a new author to kind of prove to readers that you can end something well that you can have a you can you can tell a great ending now um, one of the things that is a balancing act in a series is what to show now and what to save for later uh, because there are two conflicting motivations going on here one of which is I often say this be careful about saving the cool things for later books and leaving this book with nothing cool right this is a real danger of oh the series is gonna be great in book five well if book one isn't great then no one's gonna get to book five and so you have to be careful not to leave so much back that your first book is bad um, at the same time you do want to expand with each book I did this in Mistborn by having three magic systems and allowing myself to kind of focus on one in each book. Uh, granted, Allomancy is in all three of them quite a bit, but it's like you have Allomancy, then I'm going to add a second magic that is not quite as complex as Allomancy, and then I'm going to add a third magic system, which is not quite as complex as the other two magic systems. Um, and this allowed me to have something fresh for each book, but also not feel like I was holding back things that would have made the book better. Um, in fact, if I would have tried to do all three of those magic systems in the first book, it, I think, would have been a worse book. So that's a good balancing act. Now, if you're going to write a standalone, you don't have to worry about any of these sorts of things. Um, and you can just tell the one story that you're telling. Um, this does mean that you. one thing I've learned is you want to be careful about how many explicit or implicit promises you're making about sequels. Um, because if the book is really good, uh, you are going to be asked quite a bit about sequels. And even something that you intended as a standalone, um, you will be asked about a lot. And if you leave hints of where you would be going, then you'll be asked more. So be cognizant of that and aware of that when writing the standalone. Multi Super Guide uh, mm -hmm. wants to know if you've ever tr uh, read translated fantasy books like Never Ending Story or The Witcher. Um, I have um, indeed. Uh, I haven't read, I've read uh, several of The Witcher short stories. Um, I have read Cornelia Funke. Um, I think I'm saying that right, Germans. I'm sorry if I'm not. Um, I've read just to see what the, the fuss is about a little of Perry Rodin. Um, I've read, um, yeah, well, there, there's a few for you. Um, I, was, I was actually really impressed with the Witcher short stories. I didn't think I would like them that much because I, there, it is a bit more of a classic fantasy world in the kind of Tolkien-esque sort, of, uh, sort of tone, but they're actually, they were really good. So, um, so yeah, there you go. Cool. I was, uh, it's one of those times where I was, I was more skeptical than perhaps I, deserved, I needed to be, and I was shown that I was wrong because they, they were good. Uh, we have two related questions, mm -hmm. one from Joshua Klein and the, the other from Jess Smart Smiley. Mm -hmm. uh, one is asking, how do you remember the entire cast of the Stormlight Archive characters? Uh, because they have issues remembering the cast of their yep. uh, books. And the other one says, what is your method for cataloging, cataloging ideas and research for projects you aren't actively working on? All right, so I use two tools for this. The first is I use a wiki program called WikidPad, which is an open source wiki program. Um, for keeping track of all of the characters in the Stormlight Archive. I haven't had to do this for the other books I write, but Stormlight, I have to. And these days, Karen Alstrom, who is my continuity editor, um, reads each book after I'm done with it and keeps the wiki updated. Um, she is a lifesaver in keeping all of those things. Uh, she does a lot of, uh, of stuff kind of behind the scenes. She does that. She also creates a timeline for every book, so I don't have to worry about timeline, and then we'll put a notation at the beginning of each chapter uh, after revision three that says, this is the day this takes place on right now. These are the problems with it taking place on that day. You may want to adjust to make it take place later to be in balance with this other timeline, stuff like that. Uh, lets me know when the high storms are happening and that sort of things. Uh, so continuity editors, thumbs up. Um, if you don't have one of those, that's okay. I kept this myself uh, before I had Karen. And um, it is a little bit of a chore, but you can, when you're doing like your last revision, your last polish, you can go update the wiki yourself and you can keep track of it all just so you can find things uh, quickly and easily. Um, and I will say for those who are interested in the calendar kind of stuff, um, she did write a blog post about how she did, uh, figured out the Roshan calendar. Yes. That's on uh, Brandon's website. Um, 
And so for uh, projects I'm not yet working on, I have, uh, I just work in Microsoft Word. Um, I have one folder file, just a file that's called um, working ideas. That is just when the random idea comes to me for something, I'll just jot it down and everything about it. When an idea starts to get better than bigger than that, um, I will open it to its own uh, folder or its own file. Uh, I'll call it the book guide and I'll start expanding on those ideas and organizing them by plot setting and character. And I usually have a half dozen of those uh, going at once um, that are for future books that I may or may not write. Um, Joshua Gibson asks um, if becoming an Eagle Scout has affected your career. Hmm. Boy, it's hard to say because it's hard to say who I would be if I hadn't done things that I did back when I was a teenager. Time travel mm -hmm. paradox again. Yeah, I this guess. is just a this is very um, what if sort of uh, sort of things. Um, I do think that getting me outside rather than always being inside was good for me. Uh, being um, a scout and going on camp and campouts and being familiar with that let me when my friend Micah, uh, who Captain Demo is named after, Micah Demo, uh, asked me in college if I wanted to go with him on photography trips. He's a fine art photographer and he wanted someone to just go along with him and hold his equipment and stuff like that. And it's involved camping and things like that. And I was able to say, yeah, sure. I mean, I can do that. Uh, I, I've done that. And it was just not outside the ordinary for me. And that is where um, I went to Slot Canyons and Goblin Valley and uh, Southern Utah and uh, Zion's National Park. And the, uh, the ecology of Roshar is deeply influenced by all those trips to southern Utah I took, visiting all of the amazing landscape that we have here in Arches National Park and Bryce Canyon and Little Wild Horse and just all of that stuff. Um, and so that's one thing I can point to that maybe I would have said no if I just hadn't camped a bunch um, as, as a teenager. Um, and so there you go. Uh, Captain Jean-Luc Picard Ooh, wants to know... Mr. Picard, <laughs> make it uh, so. ...wants uh, TV recommendations TV? since people are stuck at home. Man, TV recommendations, you are coming to the wrong person, I'll or tell you. Or show, I should yes, say. Yes, because um, I, am a, I love films, um, and I tend to watch a decent number of films. But my television show watching, I just don't have the time uh, for television show. So, um, what have I watched lately? Um, here, let me, I'll do this and then I'll tell you. Okay. Um, don't worry about it. Uh, <sighs> just watch Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> um, so, uh, Good Omens. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you haven't seen Good Omens, by some reason, you are watching the stream and you have not watched uh, Good Omens. It is incredible. Um, the acting in that um, is just amazing. And that is, uh, that is one of my favorite books, as it is for many Pratchett fans, their fa one of their favorite books. And um, Neil was the showrunner, and gee, he just knocked it out of the park. Um, he, uh, he improved on the book to make the show, which is what you kind of always want to happen, but rarely does happen. Uh, so just perfect. And only six episodes, which is all it needed and didn't try to drag it on six really great episodes and it's done. Um, other than that, we, uh, I mean, what have we watched? We watched what everybody else has watched. We watched the Mandalorian and watched the good place, um, are the shows that Emily and I have found time to watch recently. Um, and I do recommend them both. Have um, you seen Chernobyl yet? I, I have not it, seen Chernobyl yet. Everyone um, should watch that. Too. Yeah, <laughs> that is on our list. Um, problem is we tend to watch shows like on date night. Um, and it's like a break to get away from things. And every time we're like, do we want to watch Chernobyl or do we want to watch The Good Place? And we're like, we would rather laugh right now. This seems like a time to laugh. This doesn't seem like a time to watch people shooting puppies. Uh, so. Oh, yeah, I forgot mm. about that scene. <laughs> um, Yoshi wants to know um, how you research. Uh, there's, they specifically mention economics and the financial sector. Uh, so economics and the financial sector. Um, so... 
let me give you a general thing on research from Brandon's point of view. Um, again, get different opinions on these things, but for me, I find that being a novelist, particularly a fantasy novelist, is about knowing a, a little bit about everything. You really do have to become a jack of all trades and a master only of one, which is writing good stories, right? Um, and becoming a master of writing good stories is really time consuming. And so you will have time for fewer other things than you might otherwise have time for. And so I tend to try to become knowledgeable about everything to a little bit. And I tend to focus on the things that are a little more entertaining. This is because I can force myself to do it after I have spent a long day working. So for instance, uh, Freakonomics podcast, right? Uh, very kind of pop economics um, or 99% invisible, right? Pop uh, design philosophy. But there's enough good stuff in there um, embedded that's gonna make you start to think about this and ask questions. And then you can kind of let read the, the level up books, right? The ones that are just, just a little bit more like History of Warfare by John Keegan, if you're interested in warfare. Again, it skews toward popular, but it's like the level two um, where you kind of have to understand history a little bit. Uh, Asimov's uh, stuff was very good for that, though now a little bit dated on his science writing. Um, but doing things like that, um, you know, getting on one of these subscription services that has, you know, whether, whether it's, we're not sponsored by any of these, but like, you know, Grace Courses or Curiosity Stream or something like this where you can, where you can spend some of your free time that you would spend um, doing something else on some sort of uh, documentary that's good. Uh, Hardcore History, another one of these kind of pop um, uh, history, a pop history po podcast. Uh, these things are really handy for me to give me, get my toes wet, right? This will tell you, at least in my, my experience has been, enough to know what you don't know, if that makes sense. And so when you run into something in your books where you're like, man, how would the economics of this really work? You have enough of a foundation to start asking the right questions, and then you can start going to experts and say, um, like I did with Calvin in his field medicine, saying, I think it would be like this or like this and have them say, oh yeah, it's like this um, and stuff like that so that you can you can get things right um, without having to spend 10 years to become an expert in everything. Uh, we just don't all have the time to do that. Now, if you can become an expert in, say, economics or become a medievalist or even become an attorney like John Grisham, that can also be really great for your writing. Uh, you just don't have time to become an expert in all of those things. So I recommend practicing, maintaining a working knowledge of a lot of different topics and practicing knowing where to go and who to go to to, uh, to get that deeper level of knowledge and then just let them read your books and tell you where you're wrong. Zin the Poet has a very important question. Mm. They say, is Adolin a French fries or onion ring kind of guy? Ooh, Adolin a French fries or onion rings type of guy. Hmm, boy. Um, onion rings, I think, probably, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, it's a hard question, very hard. Um, Lift is yes, please. Yes. Mm -hmm. Gerald Moore um, really just wants to know how to start a book. Um, so don't stress too much on starting the book. Um, a lot of times authors, myself included, will throw away the first few chapters after they finish the book and rewrite them. Um, or will realize, oh, I should have started a chapter earlier in the story, or I don't need these first two chapters. Um, so really take the stress off the starting, okay? Just let yourself start somewhere and go and uh, practice writing and practice getting through your story. That's gonna be way better for you than stressing too much if you've got the right beginning. Once you've got the book done, then you can stress if you've got the right beginning. But right now, just start. And so where do I start? I try to put an interesting character in an interesting situation and try to explore the world through their eyes for a little while. Um, and that, is, you know, a high drama situation with a character who thinks in an interesting way is a great place to start. Um, Javier Benitez wants you to just wants you to discuss the role of an editor or the the editor. Right. I the say. editor. Okay. So this depends on if you are being if you are indie 
publishing or if you're traditional publishing. Since I know way more about traditional publishing, I'll talk on that and uh, recommend that you ask some indie published people how they interface with editors. Um, but an editor is a little bit like a project manager uh, for a book. Uh, one thing that people get wrong is that the editor is the person who's looking for punctuation and continuity. And that is generally not the case. That is a separate individual called a copy editor, uh, which is a very important job, but their job is to apply a style guide to a book uh, to go through it with a fine tooth comb and to find all the errors and mistakes um, and little continuity editors, not, you know, Karen level continuity errors of the timeline seems off here, but more like you said this character's eyes were blue in this chapter and now you say that their eyes are brown, that sort of continuity editor. Um, Peter Alstrom did a lot of copy editing before I hired him um, and that's one of his areas of expertise. Um, the editor is a project manager. So what they're going to do is their first job is acquisitions. They work for a publisher. And these are separate individuals, and I did not know this when I was breaking in. I would go and try to pitch to publishers. Publishers generally are not acquiring. Sometimes they do, so it's not useless to talk to a publisher, but they are generally the editor's boss, and the publisher is generally a business person, while the editor is usually a book person. Um, and so publisher... Business person who likes books, editor, um, book person who knows a little bit about business. And the editor is going to go and try to acquire books. They're going to do this by looking through the slush. Um, they're going to do this these days mostly by getting submissions from agents and seeing how they are. They're going to go to conferences and meet uh, authors there. And they are going to look for that perfect novel. Then, once they've found that perfect novel, they are going to go to the publisher and sometimes the marketing director and people like this, and they are going to go pitch how great this book is and see if they can get authorization to acquire this book. The publisher um, will then give them an okay to start negotiations for a book, whereupon the editor is the one who negotiates with the agent. They come up with the numbers they're offering by making something, sorry if this is boring, you're asking me about stuff I find fascinating that most people find boring. So um, they make something called a P&L, a profit and loss sheet. This is where they're gonna pull comparison books from around the market, see what they sold, and they're gonna say, if we sold this many, this is how much we could offer for an advance, and this is what our marketing budget would be. If we were gonna sell this many, this is, you know, and they, they kind of come up with their best spitball estimate and they're going to be making offers and negotiations with the editor or with the agent and the author along those lines. Once an agreement has been, has been come to, they will send all those details to the contracts department who will then work with the agent on the fine details of the contract while the editor will start working with the author. Um, and at this point, the editor is going to read the book and offer substantive feedback. This is the difference between an editor and a copy editor, is the editor is going to say things like, this character's storyline is a little weaker than the others. How can we punch that up? Let's brainstorm it. Uh, the humor is not working as well as I want it to. Uh, what can we do to, to help you? And they're generally not going to write anything. Your editor shouldn't be rewriting sections of your book, but they should be saying to you, here's a suggestion, go try it. Um, where it's kind of your job to fix the book to the editor's satisfaction. Um, in the meantime, the editor will go to the art department and will pitch the book and get them a description to work from for the illustrator to do the cover. They will go to all of the business meetings where they'll pitch the book to all their sales force about how great it is. Um, and so the sales force can go and convince bookstores to carry it and all of that stuff. Um, so like I said, project manager. Uh, they shepherd the book along um, until the end uh, when it comes out and hopefully everyone is very successful. Uh, Chetel 100. Uh, wants to know how you've developed as a writer from Elantris to now and what are some things that you still work on? Um, so, developed as, uh, from Elantris until now. I think it is an eternal quest for every writer to show more than tell and to transition their kind of expository passages into powerful, dynamic uh, passages. And so that's definitely something I still work on. Um, I still... One of the big differences, differences between me now and me then is I feel like now I'm better at letting my dialogue do the talking. Haha. -ha. 
Um, and I feel less of a compulsion to modify that dialogue. Instead, I look to make the dialogue stronger so that it doesn't need the modifiers. Um, and I feel like I am um, a better at diagnosing and fixing problems in my books. Uh, Elantris was an interesting book in that uh, Elantris was the sixth book I wrote and the first one I sold. And it was the best of a little batch of good books that I wrote. The good books that I wrote were called um, Elantris, White Sand, Dragonsteel, um, and Aether of Night. Um, and the ones before those books are pretty terrible. Um, and the ones after those books were where I kind of started chasing the market a little bit more. And the books, world building got better, but the books got worse. And so there's this little patch of pretty decent books in there. Elantris was the one that worked without major revisions. And that's an accident, right? Um, it probably should have had some of the fundamental flaws that the others had, but it didn't have them. Um, and now I'm much better at noticing those flaws and figuring out how to fix them. Not perfect, as uh, evidenced by the fact that I still don't, haven't fixed uh, Apocalypse Guard, um, but I am much better. Um, so there's a couple things. Mark Lindbergh wants to know what the status of the audio novella you're working on with Mary Robinette. Ooh, Mark, you're in for a treat. Uh, we got the final version of it last week. And so right now it's just a matter of going to the publisher, uh, which I believe is recorded books on that one, so. um, and uh, finding a release date for it. It turned out really well. Um, I'm super excited for you guys to, to read this because it's... It's taking, I think, again, you know, take this as a grain of salt, but it's doing what I think I do best and what Mary Robinette does best and combining them and playing to both of our strengths. Um, and so, um, and the narration came out really well. Um, Max, who was the uh, publisher on it, um, went and uh, got some music done with it and things like that. So it's got, uh, it's got, it's scored. Um, uh, and I think he worked with someone who works at Skywalker Sound for that. That's uh, what I heard. Yeah, so um, just it's it's been a great experience. Um, Mary Robinette's contribution to it was killer. Uh, so I'm really excited for you guys to, to hear this thing. And it's I think it will be out within a month. Um, I can't say for sure, but it should be pretty soon. It's called The Original, for those who don't know. Um, and so, yeah. Reflex Jet uh, asks if you have a favorite line out of all your novels. Favorite line out of all my novels? Uh, if anyone's curious, mine is lift prepared to be awesome. I think mm, that's a great opening mm, line yeah. in general, too. I'm bad at quoting my own books is one of the things. Um, because, you know, I always... Uh, they have been a, a sentiment in my head for years before I write the actual words. This is one of the reasons why I have problems when people say, can you give me one of the odes of the Orders of Night Radiant that you haven't given yet? I'm like, no, I know what the sentiment is, but I don't know the wording of it. Um, but um, I'm quite fond of um, the uh, the scene in Mistborn where Kelsier explains that uh, Mistborn don't need to make sense because they're mysterious and cool. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's a fun line. I enjoy that line. Uh, Aiden Inferno uh, wants to know what book you're reading now. Uh, if you're not reading anything right now, then what are you planning to read or have read recently? Yes, um, I am still and uh, quite a ways into, but still in the middle of uh, Darker Shade of Magic by Victoria Schwab. Uh, is that under her V.E. Schwab? I think it's V.E. Schwab. V. E. Uh, it's great, guys. Uh, if you like my books, you will really like this book, is my instinct. Um, I am loving it. Um, many people are asking about information for the we uh, Wave Kings Kickstarter. Yeah, Wave Kings Kickstarter. Uh, if you didn't hear before, so what we're doing is we're probably launching this late June um, or early July, probably late June. And basically, we are going to ha do it as a Kickstarter. You can read on the state of the Sanderson our reasoning why. Uh, where are we on it? Uh, we are pretty... Under development? Yeah, we're, we're under development. It's going well. Um, books are looking great. Um, we, let's see, we've, we've sent them in to, to, to get bound at least the yeah. first batch. We probably will need to do we'll more batches. Um, but, uh, Isaac did some really cool things. Um, if you guys like, um, the Warbreaker, uh, drop caps, uh, we, 
got that um, person. I can't say his name. He's uh, it's Chinese. Jian Guo. Jian Guo. So I, uh, I'm yeah. sorry, my tones are terrible, and I don't. I, I could I'm, spell it. Yes, but, um, but he is amazing. Uh, you should all go to his DeviantArt page because it's awesome. Um, and um, he did some uh, some Way of Kings. He did a rework of the archways for us uh, for the the chapter headings. They are gorgeous. Um, I've gotten, um, we're looking at what we're going to be giving as kind of rewards. Um, here, I'll, I'll tell you more in a second after I do this. Hey, ma'am, how, uh, how, how much, how far are we? We've got that pile and uh, this pile, and we also have some of these if you want to move on to those. Okay, yeah. Yeah, if we you want to. If we have time, we'll do some more. We'll All do right, some more. So for you right now, so it depends okay. on how long you yeah. want to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll probably go about two hours, probably. Okay. Hey, um, so um, what are we planning to do? I'm planning to write a novella. We should have a way for you to get uh, digital-only rewards for all of these things, um, which would include the novella digitally, um, and then all of the new art just as uh, wallpapers and stuff like that. Um, we will have... Cool new art. Uh, we should have a really awesome poster that's involved in the Kickstarter. We will be offering most likely Way of Kings Prime, which is the version of Way of Kings I wrote in 2002, which is bonkers, you guys. Um, <laughs> you're going to love reading it, but it is going to be bonkers. Like It is so different from the modern one. Um, it is wacky. Um, Taln is a main character, um, and it's kind of like Taln's story about... Uh, not knowing if he's a herald or if he's a crazy man. Um, and uh, Kaladin um, is a shard bearer from chapter one um, and a knight in, uh, in Elcor and Dalinar's uh, army. It's very different book. Uh, and we're going to offer that. Everyone will get... Uh, uh, it'll be like one of the tiers or something, maybe. I'm not sure exactly how that one's going to work. Uh, yeah. We haven't decided what are the various tiers of unlockables and what or not, but you should be able to. Here's the fun thing. You should be able to pick your order of Night Radiant and get swag unlocked based on your order uh, individually, which means that the initial pitch for it will have the themes of all of the oaths not the words, like I said, but it'll tell you the themes um, for all the oaths of the different orders and kind of give you a little bit about each of the orders and you will know what the Radiant Spren are for each order. So you should be able to like pick your order and then uh, as stuff unlocks, your rewards will be related to your order. And we'll probably have a thing where you're like, I just want all the swag so you can just buy all 10 orders or something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. But uh, mostly what you're going to want is the, the actual leather bound itself. Uh, which will be $200. We've found out we can bring it at that price instead of $250, so it'll be $200. Um, and if you're not up for that, then you can buy the novella. Um, and if you're not up for that, then you can just go watch and say hi and, you know, uh, celebrate us having finally gotten this book done. It took a long time and a lot of work. So, yes. Uh, Nicole Joy White uh, wants to know if you're ever going to revisit the Emperor Soul world. Yes, I've got another uh, story about Shea I want to write, actually. Whether I'll get to it or not, um, I do have... I had inspiration strike for a story I think will be really cool if I can find the time to write it. That's always the thing, right? That's your hardest thing right That's now. That's my hardest thing. But um, because I am moving more and more to co-authoring things that are not... Cosmere. The goal is that hopefully that'll leave me a little more time for Cosmere stuff moving forward. Um, so uh, we will see. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, for instance, if uh, Skyward is the last um, non-Cosmere series I do that is not co-authored, um, so that I can divide some of my time um, off with another author. The experience of working with Mary Robinette on the original has been so good. And uh, the experience, even though he didn't fix it, Dan's improvements to Apocalypse Guard are so incredible. Uh, I, I'm actually going to try and fix that this summer. Um, but, um, yeah, um, I think we might do more of that. It's going to depend on what people think of the original and, theoretically, the Apocalypse Guard when we release it, some stuff like that. And for those who are curious about the Apocalypse Guard, if you want to hear a reading from that, um, I posted 
a panel with Dan Wells yeah. recently with uh, he and Brandon at LTUE. So uh, it's really good. Yeah, you got you should go listen to that. Dan's improvements are just so much fun. And it made it he's such a good out loud reader too. You can just listen to Dan read the phone book and it'd be fun. But yeah. and as a bonus, you can also listen to a story about Lyft. Yeah, uh, said immediately after or read. Yes, immediately it's after. it's from uh, it's from Rhythm of War. Rhythm of War. So, yep. um, all right, this one just ran out. Um, oh. I don't know how you uh, how you've been giving these away. That's um, Kara. I need to yep. do uh, the the giveaway contest on that. Yeah, so. well, I, I haven't set that up yet. <laughs> Eventually, we'll figure out how to do giveaways on these streams, and then we will give away the pens that uh, run out uh, along with the, uh, the the signature pages that uh, that are half signed because the pen runs out in the middle. <laughs> Uh, Nick Cantrell says, one thing I've always struggled with in writing is creating meaningful quotes or pieces of art in universe. Mm, yeah. Uh, poems, philosophies, etc. Mm -hmm. How do you go about doing this? So, uh, the best way is for me to steep myself a lot in somebody's style after the book is done. So, I finish the book. Um, I do this sometimes uh, with uh, with other things too. For instance, Tara Vangian's uh, viewpoint where he's very smart in Oathbringer, right? I wanted this to feel very different. Another one I did it for in Oathbringer was the Ardent who's reading the romance novel, right? Um, and once I finish the book, then I go read a ton of someone else's style and I kind of try to do a... Um, a Weird Al version. You know how Weird Al will do like uh, style parodies where he's like doing a, mo a song in the style of someone else um, or you know how you might learn how to paint um, using some great master style and then try a different great master style. I try to evoke that style um, in the what I'm writing. And so for instance with um, with Tara Vangie and I used Faulkner, right? Went and read a bunch of Faulkner, uh, very steeped myself in Faulkner, tried to get some of those big, meaty Faulkner-esque paragraphs um, and complex sentences and things like that, uh, just so that when you read Tara Vangian, even if you aren't like, oh, he's doing Faulkner, you'd be like, something's odd about, it's almost like Brandon had someone else write this chapter. Um, that works really well for poetry also, uh, and for songs in world and things like that. Uh, if you, that doesn't work. Um, something else you can do is do what I did. My father-in-law is a musician who is a singer-songwriter, um, Matt Bushman on Spotify. Um, he has since retired from that, but he, uh, he ha he's a very good songwriter. Um, and I had him write a couple of my songs uh, for, was it, it was Words of Radiance. Um, I had him, had him write all the epigraphs of the song. Um, I just hired him. And I had him write uh, Shalon's Lullaby for that book. Um, and that worked out really well. Because again, I wanted something that felt like I hadn't written it. So I had someone else write it. Um, so that's a, that's, those are two different ways you can kind of shake up your style. One by not actually doing anything to your style. But you know what I mean. Uh, Aurora wants to know if you've had any darlings you've had to murder. And which one made you saddest? Uh, saddest darling I had to murder? Well, and some people may not know what yeah. that oh, is. Oh yeah, too, okay, so... so um, there is a phrase in storytelling called uh, kill your dar darlings, which means that sometimes when you're writing a story, the story will be evolved beyond the original concept that made you want to write the story, or you will come up with something really cool in the story that you write that does not actually match the final story. Um, and in the end, cutting these things from the story can make the story much better Obviously not a one-to-one -one correlation, right? Or That's probably the wrong metaphor for it, but not always. You don't always kill your darlings. But once in a while, you run into something where the idea that you are slavishly tied to, um, the thing that made you want to start the book in the first place, uh, is indeed the thing that no longer works uh, for that book. Um, and so what are some darlings I've had to kill? Um, do you, you are, you are reaching for things. I, uh, the bad prince in Elantris, uh, still stings a little bit. Um, 
cutting the parent through the ways mm. section, um, nice. which is actually when I picked up the Wheel of Time. This is, this is probably darling that was hardest to kill. When I picked up the Wheel of Time, one of the things I wanted to do was cleanse the ways. Like this was, if you would have had me make a list of my top five things I wanted to do in the books, that would have been on that list. This is like, I'm going to do this. The ways are awesome. We haven't been there in forever in the books. I love the feel of them. And it was just one of my driving sort of things. And then I wrote the sequence and it didn't work. And I was too close to it to be able to see it didn't work. It took Harry at the editor to say, Brandon, this just is not working. Uh, we need to cut this. Uh, and so reluctantly, I cut it out, trusting in Harriet's wisdom, which was the right move because Harriet's very wise. Um, but I did finally manage to do a revision of it that did work. Um, and we released it last year in a charity anthology. Um, so um, uh, if you want to read that, darling, you can. Uh, Walter Nate um, wants to know the status of the BYU classes, considering everything that's going yeah. on. Yeah, um, so BYU classes are going to be uh, recorded by Adam in my house and streamed to my class and then put up for you guys later on. Yeah, so it's going to be for his students only first, mm -hmm. and then I'll post a whole lecture um, the following day or maybe early the following week. Yep, so... Um, so yeah, we are definitely not going to have our 250 person class continue to congregate, um, considering, uh, what's going on. Um, Michael Roth says, rating your different drafts of your book in progress on a scale out of 10, where 10 equals perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, how do your drafts improve throughout the editing process? Um, I would say that I am a relatively clean first drafter because I do so much outlining. Um, and so if a 10 um, is the final book, I won't say perfect, it's, it's the book I release, um, then um, I would guess that my first draft is probably a 6, and my second draft is probably uh, an 8, um, because after I fix all of those things, and then getting those last two points on, that, on the draft are a lot of work. Um, involving alpha readers and beta readers and things like that. Um, but um, I do pretty clean first drafts. You can see for yourself if you want to. You can compare the first draft of Warbreaker, which is free on my website. Um, I actually wrote that one uh, and posted it as I was writing it, which is was a terrifying experience, but good for me. Uh, so week by week, people just saw the chapter I wrote. Um, and you can compare that to the final draft um, if you would like. And you could see if my ratings uh, are... Um, are what you would agree, if you would agree with my ratings. Uh, David Wal Waldorf says, Brandon, I am 40 years old already. Mm. Do you think there's a point in someone's life where they might have passed the point to start as a writer who wishes to be a professional? Uh, yes, but you aren't to it yet. Um, I would say you aren't to it until you are uh, weeks away from death. Um, because when I broke in in my, I broke in at age 29, I think. Um, I was considered a very big outlier. Most people who break into the industry um, are in their late 30s or 40s, or at least used to be. These days, it's getting younger as uh, more and more uh, phenomenons uh, break out. Um, but I think that most writers still, the bulk of writers, are a little older when they, when they start this career. Um, and I know there are plenty of writers who retire and then start writing books and have a second career as a novelist. So, no, you are certainly not too old um, at age 40. Um, you would not be too old at age 50 or even age 60. So, uh, go and do it. Um, Sharkman mm -hmm. um, wants to know if we'll ever give... Um YouTube viewers an opportunity to ask you questions based on your BYU lectures that we oh questions online. about BYU lectures yeah we should we should do that um, so yeah we'll give that a try and you would be welcome to try even in this chat like it's not like you can spoil the BYU lectures so if there's <laughs> something that you can ask that I could answer um, in a way that'll be interesting to everyone then you're free to ask it here as well don't yeah, you I'll, think Adam I'll, yeah, I'll yeah I'll try and take a mm -hmm. look and see if I can catch those and yeah I'll, if they I'll come through we'll, we'll, we'll try um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, Benjamin Shaw says, you've mentioned exploring alternative ways to tell the Cosmos story due to time constraints. Besides books and films, what other mediums are you considering? Well, graphic novels, obviously, since uh, White Sand uh, is our first foray, in, foray into graphic novels. So, yes, that. Um, 
We intend to do more graphic novels. Uh, we've learned a ton. Um, we appreciate everybody who supported White Sand in its graphic novel form. Um, and we think we're going to just be way better uh, um, as we move forward. Um, and so we're excited to try that out and see what you guys think of that. Um, what else would we do? I mean, video games will not be easier. They will take more time. So while I do want to do that, they are not a time-saving uh, method. And indeed, film is not a time-saving method if I have to write all the screenplays myself, which hopefully I won't have to. Um, but uh, we shall see. So far, um, I have uh, not loved any of the men's foreign screenplays that have come in, which is why I'm doing it myself. Uh, we'll see if uh, I can do one that works. Question, we're signing there or? Uh, where uh, usually we sign. Uh, that's um, what I was thinking. That side, sign. yeah, we sign there. <clears throat> so. And this um, is your final stack, that looks ooh, like. Final stack of Mistborn. We can finally get these sent off and maybe get them back in stock. Yes, thank you for your patience, everyone. Mm. <clears throat> uh, yeah, we'll let you know You'll when these go back, come back in stock. This it, is the thing. Yeah. We'd like these leather bounds to be signed by me, but that does put a bit of a crunch on uh, on ordering them, so... That's why we're glad that you're here keeping me company on this wonderful stream. Yeah, and I'm sure I'm not alone when we would say we would rather you be writing than just signing things. I'm yes. sure the mm. comment will... Yes, most people would rather have me si writing than signing. But we do need to do all kinds of different things, so streams are are fun. And maybe we'll get some uh, some interesting fan art. Have you come up with that thing to pop up on the screen yet? Of our um, box? I'm nervous to open Photoshop. Oh, nervous to open Photoshop? Smart. Yes. Smart. Maybe we So can... I will just put it in the comments. Okay. Or in the We could actually have them me. write it in Sharpie on a box and we could or a piece of cardboard and <laughs> well, we could put it up. She's Yep, Mem is doing that. running away. Uh, Mem is awesome. Uh, for those who don't know Mem, we call her Mem. Her real name's Emily, but my wife is Emily. And so she, Mem has gone by Mem for a long time. So rather than be confused, we have Mem. And Mem is uh, now our shipping manager, right? Because Kara's kind of moved on to, what is her title now? Event coordinator? Or... Yeah, event coordinator. Yeah, yeah, something like that. She, she does the events. She does all the events and kind of oversees this. But Mem is in charge of... Uh, down here now in our basement uh, shipping you books. So if you get an email from store at brandonsanderson.com, it's most likely Mem, uh, who is awesome, and you should all thank her for being awesome. Everyone say hello now, immediately. <laughs> she <laughs> bows. Mm. Um, Evgeny Kirilov, our friend, oh, wants hey, to Evgeny. know, mm. um, if you could hire an additional editor to take a task off your hands, what would you give them to do? Uh, if I could hire a, an additional and editor? You already have two. Yeah, in house. Um, I have two in house and one at the publisher. There's not a lot more, plus a copy editor, yeah. that I could have an editor do. Honestly, um, we are kind of to the to the point where there is not a lot more that we can give to anyone else to do. Um, I I have stripped that all away and given as much as I can of it to other people. Um, at the end of the day, I have to write the books and I have to revise the books. Um, that's they just need a consistent vision i will let go of that for the co-authored books where i will either write the book and let someone else revise it or like alcatraz 6 i'll write half of it and someone else will write half of it um and things like that but um for the cosmere novels i don't anticipate uh doing that it's just too much my baby and i became a writer to write not to be a manager um and so I don't know what else I could give an editor that we don't already give them. And you um, already have to spend a ton of time managing. Yeah. You know, you probably don't want to add another yeah. person to manage. Um, I mean, I could see hiring someone to be just in charge of graphic novels uh, mm -hmm. to take some off of Isaac's plate and things like that. Yeah, but his plate is very full. Um, a felicitous Void. Uh, mm, that's a great name. It was, yes. Mm. Uh, says, question for Brandon. Uh, for each project, how do you organize your Microsoft Word files? Do you write each chapter on their own document or the whole book in one document? Yep, I write each uh, chapter in its own document, and as soon as I finish it, I'm, um, I go to the main document, uh, which is the full novel, and I add it into the full novel uh, as a chapter there. I use the document mapped and have all chapter titles under heading two and the book under heading one. Um, and this way, we just I immediately have two copies of it in case something happens. And of course, those are on the Dropbox. So they are immediately married to everyone at, the wor at work's 
computers. Um, so Adam immediately gets them. And Isaac and Peter and everybody. So we have lots of, uh, lots of redundancy. Um, and a quick question about the BYU lecture questions. Do uh -huh. you want to answer those here or do you want to maybe address those in Well, if people are lectures? watching here, I'll let you decide if it's a quick, easy question um, or if it's something – or if it's a question I can answer that doesn't require a ton of context from the lecture, if that makes sense. Then I can answer it here. Okay. Um, so. Then I think this one will fit. Yeah. Um, it says, could you describe outlining with examples? And since we have those online – Yes, I can describe okay. outlining with examples. So I have posted um, – my outline for Skyward um, on uh, um, my website, Adam, where at, is it? At brandonsanderson.com slash writing dash advice. So and can, I will put that yeah. in the uh, description notes. as well. Yep. Um, so you can read the outline. This is the actual outline that I sent to my editor and that I used to write the book. Um, and we also have on that same place the two first chapters I tried before I settled on the third one, which is the one that ended up in the book. Uh, going back to that question of sometimes throwing away the start of books, I threw away two beginnings to that book before I settled on the one that I liked. Uh, the outlining process for me is usually very goal-based and goal-driven, like I talk about in my class, where I start with what I want to have happen, and then I write bullet points underneath it in order to get to that, spit, that place. Uh, in the outline for Skyward you will read, I mentioned this at the top of the outline, I have already taken those bullet points and shuffled them together into chapters um, or scenes. Um, this is because um, I, um, I wanted my editor to be able to understand, and it was a single viewpoint um, novel that it actually ended up being a double viewpoint novel. But it was a originally started as a single viewpoint novel, and... Um, Mm. Single viewpoint novel. And so I could do that. My Stormlight ones generally don't have the whole outline. Um, it's still broken up by viewpoint and kind of goal. Um, but give that a look and see how it works for you, um, if that makes any sense to you. Uh, basically, I'm trying to earn my ending. That's what an outline is about. Coming up with my ending and finding the things that will let me earn it. Um, they also had a follow-up question to this. Mm -hmm. And it set, says, did you start off writing uh, essays, short stories, and entering competitions? And what are the first steps to take after a finished draft? Okay. So I did not start with essays short, and short stories. Um, I'm still mediocre at creative nonfiction um, and only passable at most short story forms. I'm good at novellas, passable at the others. Um, I was not a short story reader. Um, I like novellas even still, read quite a, uh, read those now and then, um, and like writing them. But I do not like, well, I do like short stories. I just didn't read many back then. Um, and so I just started writing novels. And I think this is generally good advice. Write what it is that you read and you want to be known doing. If you read a lot of short stories, then short stories can be, still be an excellent path to breaking into the market. But if you don't read them, you're not gonna do good writing them. Um, you're just not gonna not gonna know the form very well. So you should write what you know. In this case, write what you read, what you want to be writing. That doesn't mean you shouldn't experiment. Uh, I think experimenting is good for you and fun. But if you're gonna make a concerted effort at getting published, uh, don't do it in short stories if you don't read short stories. Um, What's the first thing you do when you finish a first draft? I go back through because, as I said earlier, I generally don't fix things as I'm going. I just write the story and uh, keep going if, if, when I change things and stuff like that. Uh, so when I finish, I do a second dra draft immediately. And I do generally recommend this depending on your writing style. One quick final draft to fix all those major problems and then the best thing you can do is write something else. Uh, give that 2.0 draft to someone to read that you trust uh, to start getting some feedback. Do not look at the feedback while you're writing something else. It's very hard. Uh, but write something else for a while to give yourself distance from this project that you have just finished. Um, also, celebrate before you write something else. You know, treat yourself. If you finish a story, that is a hard thing to do. Um, Back in the day, we would go to um, a, a local Italian restaurant and order big plates of food, all of my friends and myself, whenever anyone finished a book. It was a great excuse to go out to dinner. Um, 
And, uh, but then write something else, give yourself distance, uh, get some early reads on that, come back to it after six months or a year, um, and then do your next draft. Uh, Ma Russ says, Michael Whalen has done some of my favorite uh, novel covers from the mm. 90s. And they want to know if you fanboyed at all uh, that he was doing your cover. Oh, out. boy. You want to know fanboying. Oh, man. There, there are a few people I fanboy over, and Michael is one of them. I had... So when I was 16 or 17, um, he published um, an art book, The Art of Michael Whalen, uh, which was expensive, right? It was like 60 bucks or something like that uh, for it, or maybe even 80. And I just begged my parents for that book. Um, and even though it was kind of expensive, they got it for me for Christmas. Um, and for the next two years, um, I had that on my bedside table. And every night before I went to bed, I would turn to a different page in that book. And I would imagine a story that went along with the painting he'd done. Uh, for books that I hadn't read, or for his fine art pieces, because half of it is fine art. Um, and I just would dream and imagine, and one of the stories was uh, about these floating balls of light who became people's companions. Um, it was based on a painting he did called Passage. So you can look up Michael Whalen Passage. Uh, no, The Verge. The Verge is the name of the painting. Passage is the, the, the group of paintings. So my, Google Michael Whalen The Verge. Um, and that is the story that I eventually wrote called Elantris years later um, that was inspired by that painting. In fact, um, uh, I've told Michael this story and he finds it, uh, he, he fortunately was very flattered. Um, but uh, so when I sold Elantris to Tor, they asked me, so do you have any ideas who would make a good cover artist for this? And I said, Michael Whalen, Michael Whalen. And... Michael's rates are like 10 times that of everyone else. And as a new author uh, with Untested, um, they said, well, Michael's very busy and he does very few covers these days. What about these other people? And they recommended Stefan Martinier as one of the three people they recommended. And Stefan Martinier is a fantastic illustrator. And I'm like, ooh, do this guy. And I was really pleased with the cover I got for Elantris. Um, it's become iconic. Um, I have not let them repackage Elantris because I love his painting so much. Um, and so, you know, they, it, it all turned out well. But I still wanted one in the back of my head. Um, and so I waited until the right moment. And the right moment came when they had, I had been offered the Wheel of Time. And I waited until Gathering Storm had been written. And everyone was pleased with it. They were really happy with Gathering Storm. Uh, the book came out and sold really well. Um, and um, everybody at Tor was really happy. I don't know if you can understand how worried they were. Uh, publishing, like most entertainment medians, is very, very driven by its top sellers. Um, Wheel of Time at, uh, at Tor, um, sold five to ten times what the number two fantasy author at Tor at the time sold. Um, and the way that publishing works, um, you have a bunch of sunk costs for books that are kind of the same for every book, like getting a cover, paying the editor, uh, and these sorts of things. And so, plus... Books cost less to print the more copies of them you print. So a given Wheel of Time book basically would fund the publisher for a year uh, just off of that book. And it is what let them take chances on people like me, right? Because they had hits and they were successful as a publisher, they could spend money on something like Elantris, which likely lost the publisher money. Um, particularly back during that time, uh, brand new author's books are generally going to be end negative for the publisher uh, just because they're not going to sell enough copies to get over that big hurdle of all the things they have, the uh, publisher has to pay for, like a legal department and, you know, uh, rent on Manhattan and all of these different things. And so Robert Jordan passing away was... Um, number one, a very big deal because everybody loved Jim. Like, Jim was 
really good friends with everybody at Tor. He is one of the things that Tom Doherty had bet the company on, basically. Um, and uh, Harriet, Robert Jordan's wife, was the editorial director at Tor uh, for a number of years. And uh, like, you know, everybody loved Jim. He was everybody's friend. And he was also kind of the face of the company. And so when he passed away, it was, it was a very frightening time for the company. And when Gathering Storm came out, um, and uh, did as well as it did. So every Wheel of Time book sold more than the Wheel of Time book before it um, in its first year. Um, and Gathering Storm and Towers of Midnight and A Memory of Light all continued that trend. It was the the line continued um, on the on that that little graph there. And uh, so they were all very very relieved. Um, and that is when I went in and I pitched uh, The Way of Kings to them, see? When they were really, really excited and everything was going well, this is when I said, I have this great new book. I got the publisher and the uh, marketing manager and everybody into a room in the Flatiron building. Uh, Tor's offices was in the Flatiron before they moved last year. Uh, Flatiron is the Daily Bugle um, and the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. Uh, if you ever see the external shots of that, that's... Uh, that's uh, the tour offices. Specifically Tom Doherty's old office. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so you can. Yeah. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, um, I got everyone there, uh, my editor and everybody, and I pitched Way of Kings on them. And they were all just laughing at me because I brought in, like, I brought in, like, concept art. I, like, did a Hollywood-style pitch, right? Like, with the flannel board and all that stuff. And Tom... Uh, bless his heart, was like, Brandon, we're going to buy it. You don't need to pitch us on your next series. Uh, and I'm like, yes, 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 yes. I know you're going to buy it, but I want a Michael Whalen cover. Um, and Tom's like, oh. And I'm like, and this is why you should do it. And blah, 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 blah. And I want full color end pages like the Wheel of Time. And Tom, to this day, if you ask him, be like, I was just so happy that the Wheel of Time was doing well that I let Brandon get away with anything he wanted. And I can't believe that I did that. Um, it is, uh, he, yeah, he, um, uh, he, he thinks I got away with murder, but the Stormlight Archive, um, not the first book, but since the second book has, um, has been selling in that same line as the Wheel of Time was, not as a memory of light, a memory of light, like the Wheel of Time went like this, and then the last book, like, jumped up like this, but, like, Words of Radiance is, like, right here, and Oathbringer's, like, right there, so they are very happy with me anyway, that I think they're, they're very happy that they uh, that they ended up publishing the Stormlight Archive, but I got away with murder because they committed to doing full color end pages, and they committed to letting me do all this art in the books, which I pay for the art inside, but they have to print it on really expensive paper to make the art look nice inside, and so they committed to that, and they committed to paying Michael for his covers, um, and so this is the length I went to to get a Michael Whalen cover, and I still squee a little bit. Um, I've got the original of uh, The Way of Kings upstairs. I bought it um, because I told myself if I ever got a Wh Whalen cover, I was going to buy it no matter what it ended up costing. Um, and Michael is a delightful human being, and so is Audrey, his wife. They are just really great people, so they have been so much fun to work with. Uh, Did you want to keep going? Or Yeah, let's do it. What, what time are we at? Uh, we're at 9.10. 9.10. Yeah, we'll go to 9.30, guys. So... Um, I've got another story about Michael after I get back over. And that uh, yep. 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 Mm, Okay. Mm. I'll let you hold, hold that for a sec. Oh, we're supposed to stay six, six feet, Adam. I'll do that. Oh. Yeah, there we go. All right. Um, can you even see that? Uh, it is in frame. I can zoom in at the end. At the end? Okay. Or I can um, zoom in while you're talking if you want. Yeah, why don't you zoom in for a second? So if you guys want to send fan mail, um, I'll do my whole spiel again. Um, so in order to break this up a little bit, um, just so in case you guys get tired of me talking, we are going to try opening fan mail on these streams. Adam will screen them. So while I won't have seen your fan mail till he hands it to me, he will have looked through them all. Um, so, you know, if you're wanting to send something, um, that would be hyper embarrassing or inappropriate, Adam will make sure that doesn't get on stream. So just don't do it. Um, but if you want to send uh, me anything that would be, uh, amusingly embarrassing, I suppose that's okay. I'm not going to request it. 
Um, but if you want to send fan art, if you want to send interesting objects that you've made, if you want to, whatever you feel like, I don't know what you guys are going to send. I never know what you guys, like when I do signings, I usually go home with like a big basket of stuff that you have brought for me, um, which is all very cool. Um, I appreciate that, but, uh, uh, and I'm not requesting you do it. I'm just saying, I know that you like to. So we will see how that works, opening it up on, um, on the stream. Couple of rules. Um, we're probably not going to link your Instagram or your DeviantArt or things like that. I apologize. Um, you know, we might read out your name, but this isn't a marketing opportunity. Um, I'm sorry. Um, but that just seems like it would go the wrong direction very quickly. Uh, this is also not a time to send me manuscripts for me to read uh, uh, of yours. Um, I apologize. Um, uh, you know, uh, if you... You um, you know, I just want to say on the manuscript mm -hmm. note, basically the only way Brandon gets to read manuscripts if they, is if they come through his agent. Yep. So, um, And that means they're coming through a publisher, basically. Yeah, if they come from a publisher to my agent or if they're one of my friends Definitely. who gets published. Those are the books that I end up, manuscripts I end up reading. There's just not time. Uh, for this, so I apologize. I know how frustrating it is. Um, I was there in those trenches. I will say no one read any of my manuscripts, authors. I didn't even ask them to until I got published. Um, and so, um, yeah. But this is not the time to, to do that. But, you know, otherwise, uh, we'll see what you guys send. Um, I don't know that I have lengthy time to read um, quotes from letters, but perhaps if you highlight something that uh, is an interesting story, Adam can read it on air or something like that. We'll see. We'll see how Trial this goes. Trial by fire again. Trial we, by fire. We like to do those things apparently so, here. <laughs> we, we will see what happens. So uh, send stuff to that. Make sure you write attention, Adam, because otherwise it's going to go to Mem, uh, the shipping manager. Uh, she will collect them. Anything attention, Adam, she'll give to him. And then we will share it with you on air um, and we'll see how that goes. So uh, this, is, this, is, this is potentially very dangerous, but also potentially very fun. Yeah, we were warned by a, a, read, a follower yeah. of Daniel Green about this. So oh, yeah? I'm very curious to see <laughs> oh, what, what? Uh, what I didn't. That's all they said. They so said. maybe I'll email Daniel oh. and see. Oh, what get he Daniel said. to give us some warnings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Daniel. Or his advice. His, and Daniel probably have some good advice for us on that. I. I yeah, I know that other people do this online. So, uh, Daniel, uh, please feel free. Adam will contact you. Let us know uh, what we are getting ourselves into. And uh, I think having Adam screen it ahead of time is going to probably help with a lot of that. And it will save you time from having to open a bunch yeah, of stuff, we won't, which yeah. your time is probably a little I'm too I'm not going to sit here and, uh, and slice them open and things like that. Um, no. Uh, at times, perhaps Magellan will be with us, and so be warned, there may be things to get fed to Magellan. The Please don't be macaw. offended. <laughs> yeah, don't be offended Magellan eats it. It's a, it's a sign of respect from Magellan if he, uh, if he eats it. And uh, you said you had another story about Michael Whalen. Yeah, so uh, one of the cool things that happened is um, after Michael did the Words of Radiance cover, which has a, a really interesting history to it because he submitted three different versions of those, that cover that you can find online. Um, which, uh, the, the third one was the best of them. It, uh, but when he turned in the first one, I'm like, okay. Um, and then he turned in the second one, I'm like, oh, that's better. Then he turned to the third one, I'm like, wow, he nailed it. Um, though Calden, it doesn't quite look Alethi enough. We got him to, uh, to, we nudged him for, for Yasna on the next book. Um, but, um, after he did that cover, um, he later wrote us, wrote us and said, Hey, you know, um, Shalon is really important to this book. And I kind of felt bad that I didn't end up doing, um, a, a, a painting of Shalon, which is actually all right because the books have not had the feature character on the cover since the beginning. That's just kind of been a thing we've done. Like the first book has Dalinar on the cover and it's Kaladin's book. And the second book has Kaladin on the cover and it's Shalon's book. And the third book has Yasna on the cover and it's uh, Dalinar's book. So, um, yeah, uh, that's just how things it's play out. It's whatever we think is cool. It's whatever we think is cool, right? Um, and But then he said, so I'm doing a painting of Shalon if you guys want it. He just did one, right? He just painted Shalon, and that ended up in the end pages of Words of Radiance, that painting of Shalon, um, uh, kind of overlooking the, the, overlooking the Shattered Plains. Uh, he just painted that because he wanted to. Um, and uh, uh, that was just very cool when Michael 
painted something because he wanted to. Um, yeah. yeah, and then didn't he give you like a charcoal sketch yeah, of he, that same uh, scene, he, which is he gorgeous? He sent a charcoal sketch to us, uh, to Emily specifically, okay. to my wife, um, um, that she has hanging up uh, upstairs. And so, yeah, we now have, we now have, um, we, we like to collect the originals. So we have that. We have the original for Canaan Unbounded. Uh, we have, the, like I said, the Way of Kings. We have both of Howard Lyon's uh, Herald paintings from Oathbringer, and we have the Talm painting that we showed off last time. Uh, the Malteser says, what's the most fun for you, most fun scene for you to write? Uh, character banter, big character moments, or big action sequences? Okay. I should also mention we have a Steve Argyle. It hangs in your office. It's in my office, yes. yes. Uh, so banter is actually among the hardest um, for me to write. Uh, it takes a lot longer than it might seem on the page. Uh, action sequences are the, often the hardest to get right. Like the banter, I will spend a lot of time on in first draft because I know from experience that the banter is going to stay. Um, I'm not going to change that. Action often changes, right? As I go back to the scene, um, just what needs to happen in the action sequence, how I play it out. Uh, these things change as I go over the book more and more in my head. So first draft action sequences tend to be pretty vague and a lot harder to follow. Um, and those get better and better as the time goes. So probably the easiest to write are big character moments because these are things that I've gone over in my head dozens upon dozens of times before I finally write the book. Um, Hate Cast says, was there anything you had to learn specifically to write battle scenes as it seems that, like there are a lot of them in Stormlight? Um, so this goes down to what I talked about earlier. Um, Having a working knowledge of uh, battlefield tactics and the different types of things that, specifically um, things that move across multiple uh, tech levels, right? Like um, usage of reserves, flanking maneuvers, um, how you engage and withdraw. These things have changed a lot less than you might think um, as technology has changed. Um, and so learning just some basic, uh, ideas about how you would want to deploy reserves. How would you, you would want to, um, you know, how people engaged and withdrew and things like this can be very handy for you. Um, and then you kind of have a couple of different paths to go down. Uh, one of the things that we used a lot in the wheel of time, because this was Robert Jordan's methodology was to use a famous battle from earth history and change the directions. Um, uh, that things are happening, flip it on its head uh, so the map doesn't look exactly the same or stuff like this, and then try to kind of have the beats of the battle happen like they did in real life so that you can just kind of be using something as a model, just like a, an artist might use a reference to paint a model. You'll use a battle as a reference. You won't follow every beat exactly, but uh, you will use them. The issue is once you're adding magic and things like this, then battles are not going to play out like they did in uh, real life. And sure, you can figure out some analogs, but uh, as you change these things, the details, even if the general mechanics of what happens on a battlefield, the details will change even if the general mechanics don't. And so at this point, one of the things you can do that I like to do is try to remove that battlefield from an earth battlefield in ways that are going to let the people who are military experts suspend their disbelief and say, you know what, this is how it, I can't say how it would work on Roshar. It's too far removed from re the, the real warfare of our earth. And so as long as the generals are right, then even those people can give the benefit of the doubt to the story and let it proceed. And that's one of the things that I like to do. The Shattered Plains is a perfect example of this, right? We have no true analog on earth of these skirmish battles in a li on a limited battlefield um, that a d different um, armies will have to scramble to get to and um, reach before the other one. There is just not a lot of real world, anal world analogs. And so it gave me a lot of leeway to do the battles how I wanted to. Um, Justin Clark uh, says, how do, you, how do you decide if an idea is worthy of jotting down in your ideas file? Or do you just jot everything down? I will jot everything down. 
Uh, whether an idea worth, is worthy or not is not something that I'm really interested in. I just want to get it out of my head for the moment uh, so that I can focus on what I'm writing right now. And plus, a lot of those ideas will just be when I'm going back through the notebook, um, virtual notebook, right? It's a file. Um, when I'm working on an outline for a new book and there are holes in this outline of, you know, I haven't thought of this, you know, I need a character for this role or something like that. I'll look back through my notebook and find all these old notes and a lot of them will jog new and interesting ideas that could make for very cool stories. Um, Augustin Soto says, or asks, when one of your books gets a live action adaptation, will you make a cameo? And if so, which character would you like to be? So my goal is to uh, cameo in all of my adaptations as a person who dies in a different way in each, uh, in each movie. Or something terrible happens to them. Uh, this is just, I love this idea because, um, you know, I kill characters in the books. And so this is like revenge of a sort. I haven't heard that answer before. Oh, that you? doesn't happen very often. Yeah. So it basically, I get to be the Kenny um, for the, all the Cosmere <laughs> films, right? You'll have to be watching out and see when you see Brandon and then a wall will fall on me or, you know, a coloss will throw me, uh, um, you know, to be feasted upon by the others or I'll get tossed off a wall or anything like that. That's what we want to do. Um, that would so, be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Peter Jackson did that to himself, right? In uh, Return of the King, um, he gets shot with yeah. an arrow. And I know he was in all of them. But yeah, was he? he? Yeah, he's hard to, to he's, spot yeah. in all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want you to be able to spot me, um, you know, and then watch me die. You um, know, I, I say he was hard to spot, and I'm sure the yeah. comments are just going to light yeah. up They're saying, like, oh, oh, he was here and here and here. Mm -hmm. um, Dustin Taylor wants to know if you read reviews of your books. Um, yeah, generally I do. Um... And they also ask how you deal with good or bad ones. So um, good ones, as is a tradition for all artists, is to immediately forget them and fit focus only on the bad ones and remember those for the rest of your life. I, I would, I would uh, uh, heartily not recommend that, but it's what you're going to do anyway. So um, I have a fairly stable psychology. And uh, beyond that, I am... I'm very confident that what I'm doing is what I want to do. Um, and the stories I am creating are to the fullest extent of my abilities at the time. And so a review um, that is a bad review, um, I generally can take pretty well because it's what I wanted to create. That doesn't mean people have to like it, right? Um, I did what I wanted to, and I am pleased with that. Um, but... Uh, I do think it's kind of important to watch what people are saying about you. It's it's kind of hard, particularly with like books like uh, the Stormlight Archive, where I believe that the sum is greater than the whole. And so in a way, people can't get a grasp of this. Like, um, like Oathbringer got nominated for the Hugo Award for Best Series, right? Does Oathbringer, well, oh, the way the Stormlight Archive got nominated, does it deserve it yet? And I would argue you know, right? Because you can't know, at least until I get to book five. Um, and that makes, you know, even the good reviews a little, like, let's see how I can close it out, right? Um, because if I can't do that, then that's, that's material and substantive to the reviews of these books. So, um, so yeah, the, those are some random thoughts. Those were not in any real order of... Uh, yeah. So it's 925. Okay, great. So this will be our last one. Up, yeah. yeah, let's do our last question. Okay. Uh, Stephanie Ackwright says, mm -hmm. uh, what critical steps would you take to facilitate a believable descent into madness type character arc? This believable descent into madness type character arc. Well, um, it depends on it, what, how, what your level of uh, your how accurate you want to be with your psychology. Um, this is one of those areas that I've made a special area of expertise where I would say, I am still not an expert, but I'm better than the 10% knowledge I am in a lot of other things. And um, one of the things about psychology, like you even heard me earlier saying, you know, Tom, uh, wet, him wondering if he's a crazy man or something or not. We talk about psychology in ways that can be very harmful or hurtful. 
uh, to people who are dealing with it. And you can just go read about, you know, people with, uh, with disassociative identity disorder and how they feel about how they're represented in media. Um, I'll give you a hint. It makes them really depressed. Um, how how some of these things are represented in media. And, you know, those of us who write novels, uh, we are definitely fueling this, right? And you can see, if, if you've read the Stormlight Archive, I go both directions. Um, I have what I hope are very accurate and realistic depictions of mental health, and I have um, the Fused and the Heralds who are using more of a magical sort of pop culture version of their, their minds are just degrading. They're not, they don't actually have a legitimate psychological psychosis or, um, or anything like that. Um, and you're going to have to ask yourself, like, which direction do you want to go? I'm not going to sit here and sit on a high horse and tell you you're being harmful if you're just, you know, showing a descent into madness because that can be really fun. Like, The Shining is a great movie. Um, and I don't think The Shining is necessarily harmful. It was done really well. But if you do things poorly, you can be very, it can be very harmful. So I would ask, say to you, number one, take some concern for that and kind of ask yourself how you're going to approach that. Um, otherwise, uh, one of the things... I would keep in mind um, is that um, the best books that do this for me are ones where I don't catch on at first either. And that's part of the fun of this type of story, whether it be a Lovecraft story or whether it be The Shining. Um, as you are going through, you are through the, this character's eyes. You are experiencing the world as they experience, and you are going to believe what's written on the page is true and that the character is trustworthy until it becomes evident it isn't. Um, and that moment can be really cool. Um, and keep in mind that that's like one of the big reveals that you're going to have for your story. And try to decide where that breaking point is going to be um, and make sure that that one works. If you can make that one work and then earn it, uh, you're going to have, uh, I think, a stronger story. Um, all right, there we are. Um, uh, if you guys want to send us fan mail again, uh, let's see how that goes. Um, otherwise, uh, stay safe. Wash your hands. Uh, try to stay, you know, six feet away from other people. Let's not overload the hospitals. Uh, let's try to take this in stages. And uh, we will be back another time, perhaps with Adam, the new father, or perhaps with somebody else. Thank you guys very much for watching.